I have with me Robert Egger. He's the president of LA Kitchen. And we want to find out what exactly does LA Kitchen do? Welcome to the show. Here we are at the beautiful Levi Stadium. Is this your first time here? It is my first time here. I've been I, uh, I've been in San Francisco many, many times, but my, my first uh, spot time here. Uh, but it is beautiful. Um, and, I, you know, it's funny. It's one of those rare moments where I think no matter how bold the action is on the field, the real action today is inside where we got all these amazing people talking about the power of food. And that's what I dig, and that's what I do. So you dig food. How did you come to dig food? Well, I'm, I'm very interested in social change. Um, you know, I grew up at a time when... Um, giants roamed the earth. I mean, Robert Kennedy, today is June 5th, the day that Robert Kennedy was uh, assassinated in 1968. And so as a young man, I witnessed some amazing leaders talking about real change. And I always wanted to be part of that. As a young man, I ran nightclubs because, interesting enough, music to me was this amazing Trojan horse. You know, you could get people who were reluctant to talk about race or equality they could dance to those ideas if it was put to music. So I ran nightclubs for the longest time, but after I went out one night to volunteer and saw men and women standing outside in the rain receiving charity, as, as decent as it was to make sure people were fed, they weren't being liberated. So I proposed an idea that became the DC Central Kitchen 25 years ago, which was, you know, restaurants, hotels, hospitals have food at the end of the night they hate to throw away. Let's collect that food. Let's bring it to a central kitchen. Let's employ, let's get men and women off the street, give them the skills they needed to get jobs, often in the same restaurants that gave us food, um, and start to shorten that line. So for me, it's interesting, as much as I loved music, what I discovered is that food and music are both the same. They can get people to places they might be afraid to go, you know, on the dance floor or at the dinner table. Where were these music clubs that you were managing? Oh, in Washington, D.C. It was a fun time. I mean, it was when it was this transition between the glorious death of disco and the advent of punk rock. And so it was exciting because suddenly music, to me, it felt like it had purpose and meaning. And there was some action behind it. There was a sense of we can do better. So whether it was bands like The Clash or The Ramones or whether it was people like, you know, Bruce Springsteen, people were talking about issues that I think I thought mattered. Um, and so... Again, it was an exciting time to be in the club business, but like I said, it, it just here I was walking down the street, going to dream, dreaming of the dreaming of changing the world with music. Yet I, I was walking by homeless people every day, and and thinking, you know, I should be doing something more right now today. And that's why I started the DC Central Kitchen, which has led me now to Los Angeles, where I'm about to found the LA Kitchen uh, this year. So this idea of wasting food and repurposing it. Uh, it, that, that's not a nice word. Repurposing is not a nice word. But a lot of the time, there is food that gets left behind on the table and yeah. it just gets thrown out in the garbage. Why has it taken us so long to recognize this? And what has changed in the 25 years that you've been doing this? And why has there not been more traction in the space? Well, interesting enough, it's, it's becoming more and more popular. I mean, there's about 60 cities that have some kind of a kitchen now, and I'm open source. I always like to share and give people any ideas I have. But it's interesting, America after World War II, it was the first time in the history of the world ever an army came home from battle and didn't go back to the farm. That had never, ever happened. And we kind of left the culture, the agra culture. And because America produced so much food and so much wealth, it allowed us the luxury of throwing away food because, hey, it's cheap. There's more where that came from. So it gave us kind of a cavalier sense of almost entitlement on a global level that we could just throw away food. So I came along, and I was actually mesmerized. I didn't know much about it. When I got into the field, I discovered that we were throwing away about 25, 30, and now almost 40% of the food we produce. But you know what was fascinating is when I started the kitchen, I was so anxious to talk about job training and other work I was doing there, I, I underestimated how, what a nerve I had hit, that, that almost everywhere I went, from the President of the United States all the way down to a child, there was this intense curiosity and almost embarrassment about the food we wasted in America. So it's there. But what's more important is not only is there an embarrassment, but there's a fervor to do something about it. So I think it's been a glorious ride. I mean, you know, again, I've helped 60 cities open kitchens, produced about 30 million meals in D.C. But now I'm going to Los Angeles to take it a whole new level because, you know, my thing is waste. And as much as I'm very excited about wasted food, I hate seeing people wasted, too. What are the accomplishment, uh, accomplishments of uh, the D.C. Kitchen? For those of us who may have heard the name for the first time and have no idea of your work. Well, it's an exciting place. It's a, it's a place where people work side by side. My, my bag was, again, I, want, I wanted every, it's a community response. 
But every day uh, they recover about two tons of food, which is used to produce about 5,000 meals every day. And for literally 20 years, we've been doing 5,000 meals seven days a week. Um, again, made primarily of food that would have been thrown away. Um, it, you know, cumulatively, about 30 million meals have been produced. 60 cities have built something on it. There's another program called Campus Kitchens that's now on 40 different school campuses that it says in effect schools throw away food. But, you know, the kitchen is what the, the, the power is. It's not food, it's just gasoline. I want to see the gas station, you know. So that idea of using the cafeteria in a small town and a rural community to be a place where you can process meals, teach kids, I was wildly interested in that. Um, and about oh, well over, uh, you know, 1,200 men and women have gone through the job training program and gotten work. So, you know, we've been able to save the city m millions of dollars in reincarceration costs. We've added millions of dollars to the tax rolls because people are working versus going to prison. We saved them tens of millions of dollars on food costs. So no matter which way you turn, the kitchen is just a beautiful, badass machine of love and opportunity. What is your favorite meal? My favorite meal? Uh, well, you know, I, I, again, I don't know that I have necessarily a, a, a favorite meal. I, I, I become mad for salads. I mean, I just love salads. Salads, you can put so much in a salad. And I'm very interested in exploration of different ways and forms. Like, I'm interested in, in, the, in the single bowl concept of a meal. I'm interested in, in bento boxes to no ends. I'm mesmerized by the idea of smaller bites of beautiful flavored meals. And that's going to be a big part, I think, of our senior meal plan in the future, the idea of a, of a senior bento box fascinates me. Um, but yeah, any, it really, it's not so much the meal, it's the company, man. It's, it's, we always forget, you know, food was about your community, your tribe, your family, and that sense of every day being together. So for me, it's really, it's a vehicle to something much more powerful. And to a certain extent, that, that deeper hunger we all have to be connected, to be loved, to be needed, to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Um, before I come to LA Kitchen, quick question. You said the kitchen is a wonderful place to be in. Ironically, our kitchens have grown bigger in our homes, and yet we don't cook. But there are a lot of food uh, shows on TV, and we watched a lot of food shows. What is the disconnect we have with food today? Just like the folks that returned from World War II, and you said they forgot about the agriculture. You know, what is the disconnect you see today? Well, you know, it's funny. What's interesting about that that time in World War II is it's important to realize that that for a lot of those men who came back, they were thrilled to leave the farm. They were ecstatic. I mean, think about the liberation, that you don't have to go out there and with your sweat and, and sinew, you know, spend seven days a week growing things. And, and you know, think about plague, locusts, um, drought, dust, bankers, all the things that were just, they were like, hallelujah, I'm free. People willingly gave up that connection to the soil, for the, the promise that science would liberate us. So, in effect, we look at the modern kitchens. It's full of gadgets, but food is just another gadget, you know, in this modern kitchen. So what's happening is, two generations later, their great-grandkids are trying to steer their society back to the farm. It's an amazing curve and a glorious time. See, that's the sound of the LA kitchen, man. We're about to drop a food bomb on America. <laughs> so the plane just flew by and you said that's the sound of LA kitchen. Tell us about LA kitchen. You're back to your roots in Southern California. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an amateur futurist and what's coming around the corner. I see, I see, frankly, tens of millions of older Americans who aren't going to have enough money in the bank for the extra 10 years science is going to give them. So I'm, mess, I'm, I'm, I'm really focused now on senior hunger, not because I have any desperate love of old people, it's just that's where the need is going to be. But I'm interested in a different kind of meal. So the model here is to be able to access the fruits and vegetables that can't be sold in the Central Valley and Ventura just because they aren't cosmetically perfect. So my idea is take the food that is, that is in effect, going, going to waste, bring it back, job training, but also turning to the city and the county and saying, I would like to have other senior meal contracts. I would like to employ men and women who graduated from our training program to work and we'll produce beautiful, healthy meals. But more importantly, ethnically diverse meals. You know, look at Los Angeles as the home to the largest concentration of Iranians, Armenians, South Koreans, people from Central and South America, yet we try and feed kids, feed people all the same meal. And that's just not the way the world works. So I'm interested in how can you create healthy, ethnically diverse meals. So it might be, for example, a guacamole that is 30% avocado and 70% peas. You know, so it, it's the science of food to, you know, again, I want to put money in farmers' pockets. 
I want to employ people at a good wage who might, if without that opportunity, go back to prison. And I want to produce healthier, more beautiful meals for older people so they st stay healthy and active. And then I want to reinvest any profit we make back into the city through the nonprofit training program, which will start the process all over again. And since you're in Los Angeles, the natural question is Hollywood. Are you going to be working with folks in Hollywood because they would be a powerful force to help educate all of us on food? Well, that's definitely one of the reasons I'm there. I mean, you know, you can have a great idea in a box. I want the big idea to see the light of day. So the best way to do that is to, is to really use media in all its forms. And one of those will be with celebrities. One of the most interesting aspects of aging is that it used to be for actresses. I say actresses as best as actresses that I want people to get. I'm talking about gender. They would be pushed out of that system when they passed a certain age. What you're seeing now is, is an exciting era in which older actresses, actors, aren't going away. And they're, and they're actively embracing their, their, their own beauty and not trying to mask it cosmetically or surgically. And they're, they're going to be natural allies for what I do. Because while I'm interested in wrinkled food, I'm also interested in wrinkled people. And, and again, celebrating that beauty isn't necessarily youth. Beauty is what you are on the inside. And the idea of don't let anyone tell you your food isn't pretty or that you aren't beautiful. So I'm at, one, I'm at once thinking of Florence Henderson and what she does. She has a TV show, and Govind Armstrong, one of the chefs in L.A., does that. Is that what you were thinking about? Because she works with, I think, uh, wheels on, uh, meals on wheels. Right, right. Well, again, I, I'm not uh, any one thing. I'm, I'm the whole spectrum. So whether it's people who actually come into work in the kitchen, imagine how many people there are in, in Hollywood who aren't going to get a job in the movies again, but they might love to cook. Imagine somebody coming in. And, and actually working for us, and people would come in and say, wait, don't I know you? And it's like, yes, actually you do, but this is the best job I've ever had. You know, so there's, you know, again, whether it's spokespeople, whether it's a thousand different ways, I think, again, the goal is to sell America a new product. Again, this idea of, of no waste, everybody has value. Um, and at the same time, the idea that you can keep the money local through a glorious new idea of social enterprise, which to me is what I like to call economic Buddhism. You know, it's the middle path. It isn't, it isn't charity. It isn't business. It's right down the middle. Okay, you're a Buddhist hippie then. Well, I'm a Buddhist ass kicker. Uh, my final question is, since you're now back in Los, uh, California, are you going to be working with Silicon Valley in any way using technology to do what you're doing? Oh, yeah. My, my, see, every single morning. 10,000 people wake up 69 every day, and that's going to go on for 20 years. We don't have the luxury of time. So my attitude is any way to shorten the time between now and when we have a different conversation in America, I am wide open. So I'm, I'm wildly interested in tech. But you know what's interesting, and I'm hoping we can change this, is, is that sometimes San Francisco and, and Los Angeles are like two warring Italian city-states, when we should really recognize, man, we are twin, beautiful twins in a great state, in the best state. You know, they say Los Angeles is a city where the future comes to happen. Uh, and I think that we have a huge relationship that we need to build on. I love San Francisco. I love California. I just want to make it a better place for everyone to live. We wish you all the best. Thank you so very much. And it was a pleasure chatting with you today. Man, there's so much I could talk, but we'll have to say bye for now. Okay. I wish you well. Thanks.